Well, I want to talk about the opposite of what uh, Roger was having to talk about, namely the value of fossil fuels. Uh, hence my talk, a reality check on the new energy economy and some optimism for the future of fossil fuels. They're often disparagingly called fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas. But by order of magnitude, many orders of magnitude, they are the most energy rich and easily utilized forms of fuel on the planet. Thus, today we can use them in anything from a domestic hedge clipper at the bottom uh, through to uh, moon launches. The uh, Apollo program was powered almost entirely on paraffin, which is true, by the way. Their ability to produce heat, motion, and electrical electricity quickly, controllably, and efficiently is unparalleled in nature, and our ability to store and transport them cheaply and easily is also without parallel. Their utilization from the end of, say, about the 18th century, starting with coal, until now, has caused an explosion of wealth and general comfort for the world's growing population. Indeed, the one drove the other. In passing, if I can make it in passing, well, I'll move from that later. In passing, the oil industry saved the whales. Fact. The birth of the oil industry in 1848 in Baku and then later in America in 1859 replaced the need for whale oil with paraffin and that enabled whales to survive. They no longer needed to be hunted uh, and they are now actually thriving. There are more whales now, probably too many, because they're running out of food, so somebody's wrong somewhere. Incidentally, on the subject of survival of species, we're all very familiar, I think, with um, our good friend the polar bear, uh, and I think it's worth noting that when Al Gore was born, there were just 7,000 polar bears, and now I fear there are just 30,000 left. <laughs> that is also a fact. If you're interested in polar bears, um, Dr. Susan Crockford, who is an expert on uh, polar life, uh, has a website, polarbearscience.com, well worth uh, a look at. Okay. However, we are now faced with politicians who are scientifically illiterate, uh, as are their civil servants. And they think they can phase out fossil fuels and replace them with green renewable energy. Way back in 1959, I was alive then, but most of you weren't, I'm sure, the novelist and civil servant C.P. Snow, in his Reed lecture called The Two Cultures, Incidentally, if any of you remember Flanders and Swan and the, story, uh, the song about thermodynamics, it was actually uh, triggered by that lecture. Uh, he quit, which was called The Two Cultures, and he spelled the problem out thus, quote, A good many times I have been present at gatherings of people who, by the standards of traditional culture, are thought highly educated and who have with considerable gusto been expressing their incredulity at the illiteracy of scientists. Once or twice I have been provoked, and have asked the company how many of them could describe the second law of thermodynamics. The response was cold, it was also negative. Yet I was asking something which is the scientific equivalent of, have you read a work of Shakespeare's? I now believe if I had asked an even simpler question, such as, what do you mean by mass or acceleration? Which is the scientific equivalent of saying, can you read? Not more than one in ten of those highly educated people would have felt I was speaking the same language. So the great edifice of modern physics goes up, and the majority of the cleverest people in the Western world have about as much insight into it as their Neolithic ancestors would have had. I think it was well put. Nothing, I'm afraid, has changed, except that this gulf has become even wider. Partly, perhaps, because those choosing politics as a career, we've had that, rather than entering politics with any real ground sense of the actualities of life, become increasingly specialised, and the study of PPE, philosophy, etc., being de rigueur, both for politicians sometimes, and also for civil servants. Whereas I'm not saying all politicians are ignorant, there are a few who are not. Those that are don't know their limitations, and of course consult advisors. The advisors themselves are a problem. They are, in turn, on a career up, up a greasy pole, and they are very susceptible to professional lobby groups, of which there are far too many, who in turn produce experts 
who are not objective but inevitably dogmatists for their particular cause, these are more or less inevitably wrong. <laughs> the trouble is, of experts like that, the more, uh, you know, the worse they are, the more they are likely to be believed. There's an interesting case in this. There was a late uh, economist called Julian Seidman. He is no longer alive. He had a thesis as an economist that, and this is overall, the situation for humanity, materially speaking, was to continue to improve with ups and downs, more or less indefinitely. A test of this was the price of commodities, say oil, wheat, cotton, metals, that sort of thing. The experts all believed that these would become more expensive as their resources ran out. So Julian Simon wagered that they were welcome to choose any basket of five commodities and that after 10 years, allowing for inflation, they would be cheaper, not more expensive. He won his wager. The person he wagered was Paul Ehrlich, prophet of the Greens. As it turned out, he could not have lost whatever basket they chose. And here's a quote. The economist, the late Julian Simon, always found it somewhat peculiar that neither the science piece that he'd written nor his public wager with Ehrlich was, um, or anything else he did, said or wrote, seemed to make much of a dent in the world at large. For some reason he could never comprehend, most people were inclined to believe the very worst about anything and everything. Furthermore, there seemed to be a bizarre reverse Cassandra effect operating in the universe. Whereas the mythical Cassandra spoke the awful truth and was not believed, these days experts speak awful falsehoods and they were believed. Repeatedly being wrong was actually seen to be an advantage conferring some sort of puzzling magic glow upon the speaker." End of quote. However, going back to our politicians and their decisions about fossil fuels on their belief that CO2 is a dangerous greenhouse gas. I'm not going to go into the details, there's plenty of literature at the back. This is pseudoscience, of course. There is no such thing as a greenhouse gas in nature. CO2 happens to be the essential plant food and by extension a requirement for all living things. You and I are mostly made from carbon dioxide and water. It is a totally benign gas, and we are rather short of it on the planet at the moment. Farmers know this because they pump carbon dioxide into polytunnels to increase yields. Just to remind you, carbon dioxide is precisely 0.04% of the atmosphere. Any increase in CO2 is blamed, of course, on emissions from fossil fuel use. There is a problem with this suggestion. Because when CO2 rises, a small amount, so also does another gas called methane. They are always in lockstep. There's a lot less methane than there is CO2. Such a connection is actually a clear signature of natural biological decay, which is going on all the time. Only if burning fossil fuels causes increased flatulence could you, conclude, <laughs> could you conclude that CO2 increases due to fossil fuel use. During the COVID lockdown, the use of fossil fuels dropped. However, the data so far shows that CO2 levels were unaffected. This tells us, therefore, that human emissions are not contributing very much to the slow, beneficial rise in CO2. The rise is almost entirely natural. Incidentally, this question that sometimes comes up about cows, <laughs> talking of flatulence, emitting a methane, studies actually done on pasture in Paraguay of pasture that's been grazed by cows and pasture that is left to just simply mature and die in the usual way. They measured the gas that came from this and discovered there was little difference. So in other words, it doesn't matter if cows eat the grass or whether the grass dies and emits its own version of methane. Nothing to worry about. So let's um, ignore that idea and not worry about your beef burgers. Or you might worry about your beef burgers because what they put in the book. <laughs> Trying to remove um, CO2 from the atmosphere by sequestering it is a complete waste of time and money. It's equivalent to trying to empty the oceans 
uses a teaspoon on the shelf. Because <laughs> every time you take it out and put it down, it goes back in again. And that actually is what happens. There's a law in physics which cannot be repealed with direct democracy <laughs> called Henry's Law. And this tells us that when a gas is in a dynamic equilibrium with a solution of that gas, as CO2 is with the oceans, where there's lots of CO2, then any change in the amount of carbon dioxide above the ocean uh, will be replaced by CO2 from the ocean or vice versa. And so there's nothing you can do about it. That's the way it goes. So happily, this means you cannot reduce, particularly when that's off on the floor, uh, CO2 in the atmosphere by trying to sequester it. In fact, CO2 in the atmosphere is controlled by the oceans, and that in turn, their actions are controlled by the ocean currents, both cold and warm, which circulate around the planet. These currents often take hundreds of years to complete a full circuit. It is impossible to replace this form, fossil fuel, of concentrated energy with anything else. Wind, solar, or hydro, or hydrogen, which I'll talk about in a minute of time a bit. The only other energy source that gets anywhere near it is nuclear fission. But this energy source is not very portable. Uh, it can drive ships, of course, submarines and so on, and generate electricity, best used like coal for base load, but it cannot be used on a small scale. Uh, as petrol or diesel can. In addition, of course, it has hazards which makes it unsuitable domestically. There is a new fuel being talked about, hydrogen. This is a much hyped as a better alternative to natural gas, mostly methane, which we use in our boilers and cooking. <coughs> Unfortunately, there is in reality vast difficulties with this. Firstly, hydrogen is not a natural resource like fossil fuels or even hydro sunlight and wind when it comes to that. It has to be made. There are three ways to do it. Electrolysis, which requires vast amounts of electricity. Reacting methane itself with steam to make hydrogen and carbon monoxide. Or heating methane until it dissociates into carbon and hydrogen. And here's the huge downside. All these methods require massive amounts of energy input. Far more than the hydrogen produced could ever deliver. If energy in is greater than energy out, the idea is totally uneconomic. Besides the fact, the amount of CO2 produced to make hydrogen is more, for example, from methane, than would be produced by using the original methane. Not that I'm worried about CO2. The cost for consumers will probably quadruple. Secondly, hydrogen needs to be stored. You can't do that easily. It does not liquefy, unlike things like methane and so on. Uh, and has to be stored there under huge pressure, which is extremely dangerous. Um, now, interesting, it's a touching on uh, electric cars, just quickly. Um, one of the other things about them is how energy inefficient electric cars are uh, in terms of their actual use of base energy. To fill up a Tesla, for example, for a 200 mile journey, which is what they used to be, as most of them still are, requires the burning of 40 kilogram of coal in a power station. The average petrol car only needs 20 kilogram of petrol to drive the same distance. And it's noteworthy that steam express locomotives of the 1920s and 30s, for the same weight and distance, required only 16 kilograms of coal. However, there is one major worry about fossil fuels, is that we might run out soon. Peak oil is always quoted as about 40 years away. It has been for years. <laughs> Interestingly, our Victorian ancestors thought we might run out of coal in about 1860. <laughs> so are we going to run out soon? The simple answer is no. There is enough fossil fuels available on the Earth's crust, probably to last up to, wait for it, 10 million years. <laughs> The basis of this conclusion is as follows. I'm going to have a crack at putting up a picture. If I'm lucky. Yes, there we go. Here are the four rocky planets nearest the sun, of which one of which we're familiar with, I hope. Uh, otherwise, uh, that's Earth. Mercury, I think we can forget about. It's been blasted so much there's not much on the surface. Venus, which is our bright nearest neighbor. And Mars, which is uh, smaller than us. Interestingly, uh, Venus still has an atmosphere of carbon dioxide at about 95% and huge pressure, 90 atmospheres, which is enormous. So if you, at the bottom of your sat on Venus's surface, you get a sink in it, uh, you would find a lot of, you'd be under big trouble. 
Um, I'll come back to that briefly in a minute. Mars Ditto has an atmosphere of 95% CO2, but not very much of it, very low pressure. Incidentally, Venus is hot, not only because it's nearer the sun, but also because of what's called gravitational heating. The atmosphere is so dense that it compresses and heats the surface of the planet. It's nothing to do with, quote, greenhouse warming. That's rubbish. Uh, Jim Hansen used to take note. Uh, even though he suggested it. Um, however, uh, what I want to talk about, why is there so much, uh, how am I doing for time? You're doing fine. Philip. Doing fine, okay. Won't be much longer, promise. Four billion years ago, he said, when I was a young man, <laughs> um, the planet Earth was actually very like Venus. Uh, it was about probably 100 atmospheres pressure and almost entirely made of carbon dioxide. Uh, the details of that I can't go into now, no time. However, as time progressed, the first part of uh, Earth's existence was called the Hadean, which is, means what it means, it was hellish, uh, because it was being bombarded with all kinds of things from the solar system, which gave us perhaps a lot of our water, the steam, uh, and, but basically 100, almost 100% 100 CO2. Uh, next step, um, a little later we moved to the Archean stage, where the beginning of life appeared, the cyanobacteria, uh, which were photosynthesizing. That is, they were taking carbon dioxide, chewing it, and spitting out oxygen, as well as growing themselves. We know this, well, at least we can speculate strongly that this is the case. We know the atmosphere was rich in CO2, because very early rocks called barites uh, were impregnated chemically with carbon dioxide, bar uh, barium sulfate became barium carbonate, which shows how much CO2 levels. During the course of this time, the oxygen produced by the cyanobacteria caused the Earth's crust to rust. It had iron in the uh, Earth's crust, but by the time they were finished, the oxygen reacted with it to produce what we would now call crudely iron ore. Moving on hastily, uh, this continued, chewing away, um, nitrogen began to seep from the mantle, uh, carbon dioxide began to be reduced by the presence of these cyanobacteria who were chewing away on all that. And there came a point when the earth had rusted completely and oxygen begins to filter into the atmosphere. That's the blue bit that you can see, I hope. Now, whizzing on in time to 0.7 giga annum ago, that is about 700 million years ago, the Earth went through a phase of being a snowball. So carbon dioxide was about 30%, causing global warming, I think not. <laughs> Ice spread as far as the equator. However, this stopped for reasons which are not fully understood. Um, and then there was the explosion of <coughs> life from just the simple cyanobacteria. Suddenly, all kinds, I say, geologically suddenly, all kinds of creatures began to appear. Uh, I may have a press of old buttons. Good luck. There we are. Uh, examples of what I mean is that you have uh, insects, huge insects. If you think of a dragonfly today, which is about that big, imagine one that's about that big. That's the kind of thing you have flying around. Uh, in order to do that, they needed both high pressure in the atmosphere so that they could float. And secondly, a lot of oxygen to keep them going. As you can see from the blue, there was a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere. Uh, at the same time, the presence of all that oxygen, 30% or so, uh, presented a danger to the rapidly growing trees uh, and vegetation of that kind, because they would just naturally and spontaneously catch fire. The only thing that stopped them was the presence of carbon dioxide, which is a fire extinguisher as you will find if you go and buy one. Uh, and that prevented too much conflagration. Uh, the Earth also experienced, certainly probably two, but um, two major extinctions. Uh, the PT1, the Permian-Triassic extinction, uh, and then there was another one at KT, the Cretaceous tertiary, major extinctions. Uh, people worry about extinctions today. I remember asking Mr. Tony Juniper uh, how many creatures he could name have gone extinct in the last hundred years, he couldn't think of any. And yet he was telling us about 10,000 die every year. Yeah. This is nonsense, of course. Um, yes, things do go extinct, but
but it's nothing like what they tell you. But these were serious extinctions, I can assure you. Uh, and, uh, and so it moves through to, with um, CO2 reducing rapidly, as you notice, oxygen also um, reduced rapidly at the KT boundary. That caused the extinction of the dinosaurs, almost certainly, who required high oxygen to keep their body temperatures warm, and also they were so big. Uh, they needed to pump oxygen around their bodies, and when it dropped, I think that was basically curtains for the dino big dinosaurs. Thankfully, um, <laughs> as you've seen Jurassic Park, I think we'll probably know what I mean. So, I think that's it. Yeah, right, we can do that's it. We're nearly there, in which case I shall shut up. So, uh, with the fact that all that has been happening, what has been happening is that the CO2 has been rapidly sequestered into the Earth through life, taking it and then dying, so that there's vast amounts of trapped carbon in one form or another below and in the Earth's crust, uh, which indeed, I mean, I've got the calculations, you can uh, uh, look at them in the leaflet I've got about this. So, uh, just to say then that there is no shortage of fossil fuels and there's no reason that we should stop using them unless we can genuinely find a cheaper way of uh, powering energy, which I think is most unlikely, uh, at least for local things like cars and so on. So I think we can say positively that when sanity, <laughs> if sanity returns to our politicians, um, then I think we need not worry too much ultimately about the fact we will have cars and other things like that to drive around in using fossil fuels. Um, I don't think we need to worry, in fact I know we won't need to worry too much about electric cars because they are a dud, as was beautifully done by Roger earlier. Um, so keep your, keep your petrol car or your diesel car <laughs> um, and fight ULEZ when it comes your way, like the people are doing. I may add that um, Duncan Smith, Ian yeah. Duncan Smith, has congratulated the people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> old-fashioned conservative he could not imagine, but I must admit I was very cheered when uh, I heard him say he was all in favour of it. So anyway, there is a booklet on the stall out there where the coffee is, uh, which contains what I've been trying to say, so you can read it again, uh, God willing, if you wanted to, or throw it away. Uh, okay, well I think I shall end now.